we've been putting out fires left and right here uh, in our in our tech stuff. So if you will just indulge me and uh, let's. Can I say a prayer for me? <laughs> and just kind of recenter and refocus all of us. But pray with me. Father God, we do come to you now admitting that, uh, God, we are just uh, easily distracted. God, whether it's external distraction or internal distraction, Father. Uh, but right now, we just commit ourselves to you in these next few moments to hear uh, what you have to say to us. What you have to say. Not what I have to say, but what you have to say to us through your word through your Holy Spirit, speaking directly at the point of our need, Father. So right now, do what only you can do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Cool. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I did, I'm coming off of also uh, two weeks of camp in the month of June. Uh, we had the opportunity, uh, as most of you know, we did student life camp with our kids uh, here, and there's be some pictures that'll, that'll go up. Uh, on there, so you can kind of see what that looked like. We took 33 uh, kids and adults to camp this year. It was amazing. Uh, it was a fantastic group. We did some mission work while we were in and around the Talladega area. So if you need some uh, heavy-duty landscaping done, I know some people, um, but also just it was an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I just really can't describe it any other way. Uh, was just students that were that were praying. Oh, how'd that get in there? Sorry, Miranda. Uh, my bad. <laughs> but uh, but just students that were praying with other students, whether they were from our group or another group. Uh, we just had uh, students that were ministering to one another and praying for one another. Uh, kids that have started doing Bible studies together since camp. Uh, some kids who uh, feel called to go into ministry as a result of this week at camp just uh, cannot say enough about what God did through that week. And then I don't have any pictures of this because uh, a bunch of us guys went and had the opportunity to uh, lead worship at a camp over near Valdosta for Steve Brooks, Kim Jeter. Uh, they have a, a camp that they do with some other churches, and we were there as the worship leaders. And uh, just an incredible, another incredible week of doing ministry uh, with guys uh, that you, some of the, whom you saw up here playing. They've been playing camp all week, and they came in this Sunday morning and played, so I appreciate them and their dedication. But just, I say all that to say that just like last, uh, last week, John talked about boasting in the Lord. That is what that is. That's what that looks like, is boasting about what God did and what God is continuing to do. And what it should tell us as a congregation is that this, uh, this younger generation, uh, they see what's going on in our world. They, they, can, they can read the news. They can read, this, read social media. They see what's happening. And what's incredible is that they're turning their hope and their, and their hearts to Jesus. They see the hope of the gospel, and they're turning to it in record numbers. And so our job as the older generation is to nurture and disciple and cheer them on as they grow, as they mature, and as they develop in their faith. And so, unfortunately, as we move to our passage this morning, uh, that's not the case of what's happening in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And so, if you've got your Bible, you can turn there, and that's where we're going to be camped out is in chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Uh, I did not get the notes into the church app because, like I said, there's tech things that blew up this morning. Uh, and so, that didn't happen, so I apologize for that. But uh, if you've got a Bible on your phone, you can follow along just as well and on the screens as uh, also. So just to give you some context, and what we're going to do is just kind of go through these six short verses and, and then kind of just transition into what these things mean to us and why God even put these verses in Scripture. Because to be perfectly honest with you, when I read this passage for the first time months ago, uh, I immediately panicked in my heart because I'm like, God, why? Like, why is this even in, in Scripture? Why? What does it have to say to us today? And of course, God is faithful, and his word does not return void. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. Uh, and so the more I dove into it, the more richness I found uh, that has a lot to do with what we are dealing with to, in today's church and in, today, in our homes and hearts today. So Paul's dealing with, these, with the damage that's been done by these false teachers that have come in 
behind him that he sarcastically, and I love that, but he sarcastically calls them super apostles uh, because they have propped themselves up and kind of set themselves up as the peak or the pinnacle, or if nothing else, they've set themselves up as the better than Paul's, right? They, so Paul came in, he established the church in Corinth. These guys come in and start teaching a false gospel. Uh, we don't get a lot of uh, clarity in this passage and in 2 Corinthians as to exactly what they were teaching, but Paul says it's a false gospel, it's a false Jesus, uh, it's not the same gospel that he was preaching. And then he spends the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 on into chapter 12 defending himself and defending his ministry and explaining what he was doing and how he was doing and why he was doing it. But let's dive into 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1. He says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. Now, the joke is not lost on me that the youth pastor is the one that got to read that verse in front of everyone. Bear with me in a little foolishness, because if that could be the motto of student ministry, it could probably be put on my tombstone when I die. Bear with me a little foolishness. Uh, but Paul does that for, for a purpose. Uh, if I, I'm a firm believer in the idea of spiritual foolishness or divine foolishness. If I have any of my kids that went to camp with me, I can, exp I can give a quick example of what foolishness can do. Is uh, camp, y'all with me? People who went to camp, I need your help, okay? I can't get to sleep. <laughs> okay. That song played in all of the, almost all of the sessions, all of the videos, and if I say that, they can probably sing the first few lines of a song that was way before their time uh, and generation called Overkill by Men at Work, and immediately they can remember everything that, that happened at camp because it kind of sparks that. That's what Paul's trying to do here is to show like, hey, I'm going to be a little bit foolish. We're going to go, dive into a little bit of sarcasm and things like that, but it's for a purpose. And so if we're doing that, then I think we're on the right track. So at least Paul admits when he's being foolish. Like he sets it up as, hey, look, this is going to kind of be a little bit ridiculous, but bear with me for just a minute. And so the entire section from the beginning of 11 all the way to chapter 12, verse 10, he's building up his main defense and really his only qualification for being a minister of the gospel. And so I want to just kind of fast forward a little bit to 2 Corinthians 12, 10, so we can see where all of this was, was going. Uh, we're going to focus on 1 through 6 in chapter 11, but I want you to see just where this ends up, all of this uh, foolish, quote unquote, talk that Paul gives. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so that's, that's where all of this is heading, is he's going to show how all of the things that these super apostles are telling him disqualify him for ministry are the very things that Paul turns around and says, no, those are the things that qualify me for ministry. Those are the things that make me the pastor and make me the teacher and make me the person that I am is because of those weaknesses, because now Paul has to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. He has to rely on the revelation that Jesus has given him through the gospel, and he does nothing but preach Jesus and puts all of the emphasis on Jesus. And so the super apostles were claiming that Paul couldn't be a true apostle because he suffered hardships, because he couldn't speak eloquently. At the, at the time, that was kind of the mark of a good public speaker. If you could hold the, the audience's attention, if you could captivate their, their hearts and their minds, then you whatever you were saying, even if it wasn't true in this case, was considered to be good or considered to be truthful. And so Paul proves in the very passage that the very things that they are accusing of are the, what qualifies him to be God's messenger. And through, for that reason alone, I think is why God put this, this passage in Scripture. I believe that is why it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. If for no other reason, it's so we can see what a true minister of the gospel looks like. 
And for pastors like myself, it's an example for us to follow. It's kind of a check that we can give ourselves is, am I operating out of my weaknesses? Am I operating out of uh, what God has called me to do? Or am I doing this for my own gain? But it also, for anyone who's not a pastor, it gives you characteristics to look for in order to spot a fake or to spot the real deal. And so we can look at the life of Paul, we can look at all of the things that he did, all of his teachings, and we can kind of see what a true minister of the gospel looks like. And I think this is really evident when, it, when we get to verse 2 and 3, because we see Paul just showing his true love for the church in Corinth. Like he loves them, and he uses a couple of different, uh, a, a couple of different analogies and illustrations. But in verse, look at verse 2 with me. He says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Paul's love, he uses the illustration of a father who betrothes their daughter to a godly man. If, you, if you're a parent in here, you, we don't have this same setup, but you can probably understand how, how frustrating or how disappointing it would be if you arranged a, a good person for your child to marry, and then instead of marrying that person, they run off with the first loser that they find that just kind of tickles their ear and tells them what they want to hear, and then off they go. That was what Paul was feeling in this passage, so it's motivated it, Paul's love is what's motivating him to defend his ministry. And he uses these two different illustrations. First, he uses this idea of a father who has a, a, a daughter that is betrothed to the right person and now, and now has strayed from that. But it's not just in verse 2. He uses a different illustration in verse 3. But he says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning... Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And so he, he switches, switches it a little bit, but he compares them to Eve being deceived in the garden. And they're being led astray from Jesus, but not by these false teachers that were coming and refuting the deity of Jesus Christ. They weren't, they weren't coming with absolute evil intent, they weren't coming with some teaching that was completely opposite of what Paul was teaching. What did they do? They actually took Paul's teaching, just like Satan took God's command, and twisted it just a little bit for their own benefit and for their own, for their own good and for their own, uh, to gain wealth, to gain power, to gain notoriety. And so they took something that was good and something that was true and just twisted it just enough to make it lead these people astray from their sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So, uh, let's continue on in verse, in verse 4. He goes on to say this, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so he's kind of scolding them, again, the way a father would scold a child and correct a child is motivated out of this sincere love for them, but also with enough force and with enough authority behind it to let, him, to let them know, like, he, this is serious business. This is not just something that they can gloss over. And so here you start getting a picture of what these super apostles were doing. They had come after Paul and twisted his teaching that he received from Jesus himself. And if you've not done that, you can actually see, uh, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 1, where he talks about the fact that he is not teaching a gospel that he just heard from, so, from some source and heard in passing by some other, some other teacher. He says this in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. Verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now we know from Paul's life that he was that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and after that, Paul actually spends a, a scripture says 3 years, 3 years 
and we don't have a clear detailed picture of what that looks like, but I assure you that as a Pharisee, he was probably going back to the Old Testament. Now with this new revelation of Jesus Christ being the Messiah and reading the Old Testament with an entirely different lens and seeing how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of the law and all of the prophets. And then scripture talks about the fact that he goes, he actually went to Peter He went specifically to Peter, stayed with Peter for 15 days, and for the express purpose of making sure that the gospel that he was preaching to the Gentiles, because remember, Jesus sent him specifically as an apostle to the Gentiles. He gave him specific instructions. He's like, I got these guys over here that are going to the Jews. I need you to take the gospel specifically to the Gentiles. And Paul was so adamant about making sure that the gospel that he received was true and right and accurate that he goes to Peter and he's like, hey, can you double check my work here and make sure that this lines up with what you guys are teaching? And Peter and the rest of the apostles give give Paul the endorsement that he really didn't need, but it's great that he had it. But Look at, uh, on, the, on the slide, it says, Paul received the gospel straight from the source. Jesus. <laughs> he received the gospel straight from the source, which is why he was considered to, he was given the, the title of apostle. Paul wasn't coming into Corinth teaching about some dead preacher from Nazareth. He had the gospel of Jesus Christ handed to him personally, first on the road to Damascus, and then through years of study of the Old Testament and Jesus' fulfillment of the law and prophets. This was not some fly-by-night operation. So let's look at verses 5 and 6 in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, Indeed, I consider that I am, I, I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. So Paul actually kind of concedes a little bit of the argument here, right? Uh, He kind of, either he's humoring them and saying that, okay, fine, they're a better speaker than me, whatever. Or he may may be conceding part of the argument of like, look, those guys are slick. (laughs) Like they, they have a good presentation. They know how to captivate an audience. But what does he say? I am not inferior in knowledge because we know Paul knew scripture. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the prophets, and he also knew the gospel because it was given to him by Jesus Christ himself. And he says, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. So it's obvious that Paul may not have been the greatest public speaker, but he was a brilliant teacher when it came to revealing truth through God's word. So I put this, put this note in here just to, just to make some good clarification. On this next one, it says, Apostles aren't man-made, they're appointed by Jesus. Apostles aren't man-made, they're appointed by Jesus. Now, Paul doesn't really go into a lot of kind of discrediting these super apostles other than the fact that he just kind of sticks to his own, uh, his own personal self and what he's doing. But... Judging by my Instagram feed that has people and pastors calling themselves apostles today, I figured I might as well just go ahead and quickly throw this in that, uh, that there are no apostles living today. Because why? Because the title of apostle, the role of apostle, is no longer in operation because in order to be an apostle, you had to have been with Jesus while he was on doing his earthly ministry and you had to see him physically resurrected. Now, Paul was kind of grafted into that, and he even talks about how he was kind of uh, an apostle that was unnaturally born, or born too late. And he kind of admits that he wasn't with Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he did see Jesus physically resurrected on the road to Damascus. And so, and Jesus personally chose him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So from all things that we can tell through Scripture, that was the end of the office of apostle or the title of apostle, and so there is no more of those around today. So that's some information that can help us understand 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through, 1 through 6. But as I'm sitting here reading this, and I read this multiple times while we were at camp uh, this past week, and just praying and asking God, okay, God, why? <laughs> like, what, is this, what does this do for us? And we're going to get to that. But first, uh, first a story. And in the midst of everything, I did forget. Sorry, Mike. He's got to follow me <laughs> over here. But I did want to tell, the, tell a quick story. 
of, oh, my water bottle. I know it's exciting, right? Um, but while I was getting, while I was working yesterday in the office, uh, well, first, some backstory on, on the water bottle. This is what all the cool kids carry around, by the way, in case if you don't know. <laughs> but uh, water bottles now are a status symbol. Uh, this is a cheap one from Walmart because, I mean, come on. Um, but, so, but we were going to camp, and I was like, well, you got to hydrate or dihydrate. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that I had some, had some kind of a water bottle. And I even managed to uh, pick up a sticker while we were at camp, uh, while we were at Shaco, and put that on there to kind of, you know, because that's the other things that the cool kids do. You got to personalize it so it doesn't just look like a standard water bottle like everybody else's. Uh, so I'm keeping up. I'm trying. I'm 42. Come on. Give me a break. But I was... Uh, So I was working and I was kind of taking a little bit of a break and I noticed like, hey, I've got a disc golf sticker because, yeah, uh, I got a disc golf sticker the other day. I want to put that on my water bottle. And so I turned the water bottle like this so that I can put the put the sticker on there. And I'm like very meticulous because I want to make sure that it's not just, you know, crooked or anything like that because that'll just drive me nuts. Uh, So I'm really meticulous. I take my time. I get the sticker on there. But what I did not realize is when I pulled, when I, when I was like looking at my handiwork, the little spout was like this and I was like, well, that's weird. And so I put the spout down and I'm like, well, gosh, if the spout was up and open, like it would spill out. Right. And then I noticed that half of my desk is literally covered in water. (laughs) And the puddle is going rapidly to the left there where my laptop is sitting. And so I do what everyone would do. I grab the laptop, I shut it down, kind of put it over onto the couch and start grabbing paper towels and cleaning up this mess. Yes, my desk was already a mess. This made it much worse. And so I'm sitting there and I'm going, after all of this is done, and and God just kind of, you know, pricks me and says, you know what? Use it. Use this. And I'm like, well, I don't know how you could really, how you could really get out of that. But here's the point of this little parable that God had me enact. <laughs> if I had dropped the water bottle straight onto my desk with it open, it would have made a really loud sound because it's metal. I'm not going to do it. It'll be loud. <laughs> oh no, some of you might want to wake up. But um, it would have made a really loud sound. Water would have started pour, like gushing everywhere and flying everywhere. It would have been very obvious that something was wrong. But because, it's closed. I'm like literally double checking it every time I do that. But because I thought that everything was okay, and I thought that I was doing everything the right way, I didn't even realize the slow leak that was happening. I didn't realize how close I came to disaster of destroying a a very expensive and very nice laptop. I didn't realize any of that. I couldn't hear it. I didn't see it. It's clear water. It's a clear desk. And that's what Paul's confronting them about. He says, look, it's not like somebody came in there and dropped a theological bomb on you. No. All they did was just make enough room for a little bit of a leak to happen. And slowly but surely, you've been led astray from your pure devotion to Christ. So what does this all mean for us? We let false gospels lead us astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ all the time. Believe me, it gets more uncomfortable. (laughs) I started sweating just writing it. Let's put it that way. We, are led, we, are, we let false gospels lead us astray all the time. First off, in the church. And that's probably the one that you would go to first, right? Being, being with, the, with this context. We think of some fringe group who call themselves Christians, but hold on to some false doctrine or false belief. Uh, and they just kind of make that the main thing. And usually you can kind of break these churches down, these false gospels that find, them, find their way into churches on a spectrum of the gospel of legalism or the gospel of tolerance. 
right? So it's kind of a kind of a, a wide spectrum. But usually, you can find that, that most churches who stray from the true gospel to a false gospel will find themselves veering to one side or the other. And so we're not going to talk too much about that one, but some may lean heavily on obedience and holiness on the legalism side, or you could just label that control, right? Which is a little bit of what we see these super apostles doing uh, that you'll see later on in this, in this passage in chapter 11. Or they go the other way towards social justice and inclusion that ultimately will lead to universalism, which is, you know, we're all God's children and everybody's okay and there is no need for surrender and sacrifice and holiness. And so usually we find churches kind of falling into one of those two false gospel leaks where things just kind of slowly and subtly shift to the point where they're no longer recognizable as a church that is following after Jesus. But I want to talk a little bit closer. So the other place that we allow false gospels in is in our homes. We allow it in our homes. And this sometimes can take the, uh, this looks different, but in many ways can be even more disastrous because we all know that if you can tear apart the home, the Christian home, uh, then the fabric of everything else kind of just starts to unravel along with it. And so I broke this down into two different ones, the gospel of entertainment And this seed of a false gospel has many different variations. Sometimes it takes the form of worship of entertainment. If something is entertaining, then it's worth our time and attention. And sometimes it takes the form of just checking out, right? We're just all easily distracted and easily easily taken in by just checking out. I've worked all day. I've gone to school all day. I've had all these things coming at me. I just kind of want to turn my brain off for a while. And to a certain extent, there's, there's some okayness in that. But then it just kind of becomes the routine of the family. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves just slowly letting in the false gospel of entertainment is going to be the thing that makes it all okay. And so you got the gospel of entertainment You've also got the gospel of performance, the gospel of performance, which can also be described as a worship of success. And I've been in youth ministry now for almost 20 years. And let me tell you, I see this happen time and time again. It happened 20 years ago. It's happening even more so now. But you might, might go to the standard of the worship of sports or hobbies that end up running the family's schedule and taking up all of the family's time. But more recently, I've seen not just that, but the worship of academics, because college is expensive, y'all. <laughs> And so if I can get my kid to get good grades, then I can get my kid to get the scholarships. We can get the kid to college. We, and believe me, hear me, hear me clearly when I say, from here on out, nothing that, nothing that is going to be mentioned is in and of itself wrong. They're not evil. Sports are not evil. Academics are not evil. The worship of academics is what makes it evil or artistic performance There's even a sneakier one that I've noticed popping up here recently, but it's the worship of spiritual performance. It's that the worship of spiritual performance looks like where the outward appearance of doing good is more valued at home than the idea of loving Jesus. Because let's be honest, parents, your children's behavior is a reflection on you, correct? And so it is easy for us to slip into the gospel of performance and say, well, if my kid looks good and does good and acts right and is respectful and is, I, I've, I didn't ha- don't have this in my notes, but I literally uh, sat, uh, sat at the bean the other, uh, this was probably more than a year ago, but it doesn't have, no offense to you guys. <laughs> But I was just there. I was waiting on a meeting to start, and I was just kind of next to a table of ladies that were talking. Don't know them. Don't, couldn't, couldn't tell you any of their names or couldn't, probably couldn't uh, even point them out in a lineup. But they, one of them said something that just broke my heart because they were talking about their teenagers, and they said, well, if I can just keep her from getting arrested or getting pregnant, then I think I'll be all right. That was the definition of parental success. 
here. The definition of success was as long as, long as they look good on the outside, I'll look good as a parent and everything will be okay. Do you see those false gospels just leaking their way, <laughs> leaking their way into our hearts? Which kind of brings me to the last one, which is sometimes the false gospels go even deeper and they're false gospels that we let directly into our hearts. And these are false gospels that can take on some really tricky disguises because on the surface, they look good and sometimes even admirable. But it's the gospel of feelings. It's the gospel of feelings. This is when we kind of just let our emotions be the engine of our lives. And for some, that may be an emotion of sadness. For some, that may be an emotion of anger. But we just allow our lives to be run completely by what we feel at the time. There's entire movies about it. <laughs> Good movies, but still false gospel, right? It's still a false gospel because the emotions are the ones that are in control in the movie, <laughs> not Jesus. So they look good. They even seem admirable. I had, to, I had to really take this check in my life and scale back on, on my consumption of social media because I kept noticing more and more of the things that kept popping up were so, so-called like self-help and advice videos from experts that were telling me to be more mindful and be more uh, reflective of what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And again, on the surface, this seems like a good thing. The idea of self-care definitely resonates with all of us, right? Oh, yeah, I do. I do deserve a break. And not saying that it's evil, but if we allow that slow leak to continue, to continue, to continue, what I found in my own life was that my thoughts and my attitudes started coming more and more about me. And so if it wasn't about me, then why would I care about it? And so my thoughts and my attitudes and the things that, that held my attention became more and more about me and less and less about Jesus and certainly less and less about others. It was a slow leak of a false gospel just kind of weaseling its way into directly into my heart. And Thankfully, by the grace of God, I was able to recognize it and just kind of like, okay, we're cutting that, cutting that out for, for a minute. So 1 Peter says it this way. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And now, when I was reading that verse, I just, the word that popped, popped out to me was sober-minded because that's not really a phrase that, or a term that we use much these days. So when I'm reading scripture and I come across a phrase that is kind of uh, seemingly outdated or I'm going, there's probably a reason that that's been used and that's still being used in modern translations. And so I came across a very good article by Paul Tripp and he just, he's going through this verse and he says this uh, sober-mindedness is living with eternity in view. Living with eternity in view. And he goes on to explain this further. He says, when you live with eternity in view, you begin to eavesdrop on eternity. And you begin to hear what they celebrate. And he goes on to kind of describe that if you do that, you notice that the people who have already gone before us, when you read in scripture about the scenes in heaven, they're not celebrating their new job. They're not celebrating their new boat or their new house or even their children. They celebrate Jesus. And that's it. They celebrate Jesus. And so I, I mentioned we got to, uh, had camp recently, and it was just amazing to be at camp worshiping with students and adult leaders that were doing just that, celebrating Jesus. It's one of the closest experiences to heaven 
on earth. And again, this is only by the grace of God that I'm sitting here last night. And I remembered, oh yeah, there was like a little blurb that I recorded of our camp speaker because I wanted to put him in the highlight video because he did an excellent job. And I, honestly, I don't even remember his name off the top of my head. Some of the kids might. But uh, Adam? Yeah, Adam. Uh, but I just recorded this clip of him not thinking about it just to put it into a highlight video. I was going to cut the audio anyways. And I actually listened to it. And I want you to listen to it as well. This is unique what God is doing. To be able to sit and listen to a thousand people who are all singing in unison, all hail King Jesus. Did you hear it? There's this little glimpse that you and I are getting of what it can look like when revival truly breaks out. Where it's not one of us or two of us or ten of us or twenty of us. But when we actually begin to see the intensive movement of the Holy Spirit and a revival kicks off to where almost everybody begins to say, all hail King Jesus, the revival is possible this is unique what god is doing to be able to sit and listen to a thousand yeah i didn't fix it but you get the point it's we start when we live with eternity in mind we start celebrating what they celebrate in eternity which is jesus and so paul tripp goes on to say this about being sober-minded and about this idea of us being so easily distracted. He said, I need that clarification of values today because what happens is things that are not important rise in levels of importance. And they begin to claim my heart and claim my behavior. They claim my emotions and my life gets diverted. And hopefully you're seeing all of these different false gospels and you start seeing a common thread in all of these is this, it says they can, dis, they can all disguise themselves as good things, but none of them are true. They disguise themselves as good things, yet none of them ultimately will lead to life. None of them will ultimately lead to joy. None of them lead to peace. None of them lead to any of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians. Why? Because they're false gospels. They've worked their way in to our churches and to our homes and to our hearts. And they've twisted the gospel just enough to make it seem good and to make it seem trustworthy. Yet it leads us astray from our pure devotion to Jesus Christ. Which leads us to the last question. So what? And for that, I just want to, want to leave you with one statement and then one more scripture that pertains to it. It says, we have to be on guard against anything that leads our heart and mind away from Jesus. We have to be on guard. It was something that I, that I, I mentioned to myself and to the guys that were playing uh, this past week at camp. Because about midway through camp, we start getting tired And we start getting frustrated and we start just kind of like, this has become a little bit of a routine that we're, that we're getting ourselves into. And I said, we have to be on guard. We have to be aware of what is going on with us spiritually, because it is so easy for us to let anything, even good things, lead our hearts and our minds away from Jesus. And I want to end with Ephesians chapter 5. This is verses 15 through 17. Paul says this. He says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I just want to emphasize those first two words. It says, Look carefully. Look carefully at how you walk. And that's a, that's a challenge to myself and my family as much as it is to you and your family. Look carefully how you walk. Ask God to point out these false gospels that have just slowly but surely worked their way into our hearts and our families and are leading us astray from our true calling, which is to follow Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, we do. 
just have to confess that oftentimes we let these false gospels work, th- work their way into our lives. And God, they just seem like good things, but ultimately they distract us and lead us astray from who you are. So Father, I pray everyone who hears this today, that hears these words and these scriptures, just be reminded of who we are in Christ. Reminded of how important it is for us to not look to the right or to the left, but look straight ahead directly at Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. He is the author and finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end. So, Father, help us in our unfaithfulness to run to you in every circumstance of life, to run to you, to examine how we live our lives, God. And through your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray that you would point those things out, shine a light into the darkest places of our souls so that we can surrender them to you. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.